on location once again thank you for joining us i'm dan schmidt this is deer talk now the deer talk now podcast is rolling today's guest a good friend industry buddy and so much more uh helpful with a lot of things on my homestead trent marsh trent from spy point trail cameras trent thanks for joining us today man it's good to see you dan how are you i am doing well i'm not doing as well as you i don't know about all that yeah you're a warrior you're 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 really rocking and rolling it's a thing it's we a got, thing. Uh, no, no week. You know, it's the one, the one time a decade we don't have that week between ATA and shot. So nice. Which is nice. It's roll from one straight to the next, and the voice is already suffering. And I think nine meetings yesterday, every hour on the hour, and just plug through. But you are, out. man, you are going through them. If you guys don't know Trent, Trent's been in this industry for quite a while now. He's been a deer and deer hunting friend and. Um, to a partner for for many years or going on a decade I think more than more yeah. than a decade um, we are on location here uh, if you hear a little background noise this is uh, we're in Indianapolis at the archery trade show um, I've been doing these for 28 years when it back to when it was AMO mm-hmm. um, and what do you think Trent I mean we're just gonna talk about this a little bit but you know our listeners, everybody, if you're listening to this, you've obviously downloaded the podcast. If you're watching it, you've seen us on social media. Um, we're going to just talk about the industry a little bit. And then where do you see archery and hunting right now in America? How are we doing? It's, yeah, the, <laughs> that's a really big loaded question, right? I'm just going to let you talk for like yeah, 25 minutes. That's great. I'll just sit um, back. It's, it's good and bad, right? Like, And it's that's kind of the easy out answer for pretty much everything right like it's it's tough for us to gauge i think because we're <clears throat> excuse me we're so close to it right right like i was having this conversation with with some other folks this week you know i've been marketing in this industry for more than a decade now and they're asking like well how do you how do you do this i said well it's easy to market to the hardcore guys and i think that's who we kind of get caught up being focused on because that's largely who your reader is. Yep. At least your subscribe, not necessarily your reader, but that's who your subscriber is. Yes. So when we talk about those people, it's easy for me to go market to them because I know they're picking up deer and deer hunting and they're they're reading it or they're watching deer tech or they're wa- you know, like they're engaging with it all the time. But that's a really that's a Very much smaller small. audience than people think it is. Um, you know, you, you've got a lot of options for outdoor content. So if you're trying to use like outdoor content as a measure of how many people are doing this, how many people are paying attention, and really the numbers are smaller than you would think. So then my challenge as a marketer is I, I know how many license sales there are. And I know how many subscribers and viewers there are over here because the industry reports it because they want my money as a marketer, right? And there's a big delta there. There's a big gap, which means there's a lot of people buying hunting licenses that aren't interacting with the industry on a daily basis. So how do you market to those people? And I think that part of the industry is actually, that's the part that's growing. And some of it, it's not just one portion. You know, we've seen the locavore move. You know, everybody's talking yep. about the local vore, the field to fork, the or, you know, whatever, whatever little cute name you want to put on it. That's been a growing thing for folks that they want to provide their own, their own food to their family. They want to have a more connection to where their food comes from. So there's that element. Um, you know, the adventure element too. And I mean, as much as I'm sick of talking about, it, you can't, you can't not talk about COVID at this point. People couldn't go do X, Y, or Z. <clears throat> they had to find something to do. And in a lot of instances, that was hunt, fish, hike, bike, a lot of that kind of outdoor stuff that 50 years ago, everybody grew up doing anyway. And we've kind of moved, a lot of us have kind of moved away from that. So it's it's growing and it's good, but it's it's uh, it's been something that it's tough to get back to it. And we've had... There's movements that have done it, but I think the industry is largely healthy. I do. You know, they're, they're, the, those people that are super engaged are still super engaged. They're as hungry as ever. It's just there's going to be a, a percentage of our audience that always kind of comes and goes. They hunt for a couple years. They don't for a couple years. It, those transient members of it, those are the ones that it's tougher to gauge, and it always feels like, oh, hunters are on the decline, and 
you know, they are, but then they're not. They're and then not. the next no. survey, like it just, it's so tough, tough to track it. Um, but I, I think for the most part, we're in a good spot broadly. We got issues. I mean, and, I mean we can probably get into some of those. We want to, I want to talk about some of those. One of the things um, that I wanted to touch on is I agree with you because I've seen it the, my entire career. We, I just used this analogy with Josh Honeycutt. Uh, we were doing a, a podcast with him another deer and deer hunting contributor um and you will get this reference if you didn't hear me say it already but remember george carlin oh yeah he said it's the same three rednecks winning all the races uh-huh. it's the same no offense to anybody we're marketing the same three three not the same three we're marketing basically to the same two hundred thousand whitetail hunters right that we've been doing forever and there's nine million of them right you know so it's like well there's nine to eleven whoever whoever whoever's survey you're you're, you're looking yeah. at but um and there's like four and a half million bow hunters um and that really has not changed no people say hunting's on the decline. no it really it isn't right it isn't it might it goes in ebbs and flows in regions in pockets um landscapes change we don't do deer drives anymore mostly well that's what we all did when we were growing up Mm -hmm. everybody's sitting in a tree stand or a bank blind or something like that doing it um and we're not letting people so it does change things but um if I could take my negative glasses off and look at it like what you're saying is uh, there's a lot of people that we're not reaching that we don't know that they're there and they're not the people that fit our particular algorithm like there right. there are people who are I mean I grew up my still my family members they're people that hunt two or three days a year and that's it yeah and they're raising chickens and hogs and stuff yeah. on the on, uh, and, and they're doing their other thing and it's like or they're hunting adjacent like yes I, that's kind of that good they're hunting adjacent excellent excellent, excellent. And, and um, we do have newcomers. We do have a, adult onset hunters, which I think, just from my view, you tell me your view, that at a percentage that we haven't seen before. Yeah. Like I said, that, that I think is, whether it's the locavore movement, whether it's the COVID impact, whatever the case may be, there's a, there's, that's the portion where it's, it's really changed. And we'll go political for just a second. Like it, it kind of breaks down into the old Donald Rumsfeld quote. There's no knowns. There's known unknowns, and there's unknown unknowns. So much of the hunting community is an unknown unknown because they're coming and going in a way that we can't track right. We can't see where they're two or three days a year. How do you market to that person? How do you communicate deer hunting to that person? It's tough. Yeah. So let's let's talk about the negatives for a little bit. Um, what are... Uh, and you and I talk about this a lot, so I, I know what we're going to talk about. But um, what are some of the negatives that we're not only that we're battling, but just hunt the hunting community is battling in general? It's not just hunters. It's like I so growing up, I trained and showed quarter horses and paints, and you see it there. You see it in any any niche hobby, right? <clears throat> There is a unique ability. I just think hunters are better at it. Anybody that does anything differently than you is thought of as your enemy. Bow hunters look at gun hunters and say, they're shooting our deer. And it, hubris may not be the right word, but it seems like that's that's the only word I can come up with to where, um, you know, just the amount of infighting that we seem to like to do. And some of it is... Well, by nature of this, right? You walk around this, what kind of bow do you shoot? Like, even even with your friends, you have this adversarial yeah. element to it. Oh, yeah, yeah, your Hoyt's nice, but you shot my Matthews. Like, it's that whole vibe. And then that carries over into, oh, well, you're hunting with dogs. Oh, you just sit in a tree stand? Oh, you're shooting a cross stalk. gun. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah cross gun. Yeah. Like, it just, <laughs> it's that... It, a lot of it's rooted in what it is that we love about it, but we take it to an unhealthy place. Why is there? It's just an. It's just a pervasive jealousy among people. Is that just human nature? I, well, like I said, I, it's. If I go back to like go back to my past life in the horse training thing, you see it there too. Yeah, you know, I like to drag race car oh, God, Mopar guy oh, Chevy's crap oh, Ford's crap. like it's just it's yeah I think some of it's a human nature thing and it's it becomes I mean, now see now we'll go political again like was it I believe it was Reagan that was like somebody that agrees with you 80% of the time is an ally not an enemy 
and we could get on the political spectrum and argue about all those kind of things too. But like, you know, I, last few years I've gotten into trapping and it's one of those things where people who I would, if I were to just sit down and say, you know, on my Facebook list, who's going to give me hell about trapping? I would not tick the box of guys that are hunting, but by and large, the pushback I've gotten are from people that I would think would be aligned with. Wow. And it's the, the, that element of it, like I may not want to do X and, and some of it, you know, I, I might've been a little more acerbic about it when I was younger. And as I've matured, it's, you know, you, you try to raise your kids and tell them not to yuck somebody else's yum. God, that'd solve a lot of the problems we have in the hunting community if you just say, hey, you know what, that's not for me, but I'm just going to shut the hell up about it because right. I can still do what I want to do. Right. You know, the antler point restrictions is one that drives me. I just, I hate it. And I hate it because before I die, I'm killing a gross 125 six point. Oh, I know that. Like, I, that we've talked about it yep. so many times that we just had the issue come out with Bob Rob's story not that long ago that you were in camp texting me pictures yep. of this deer just tormenting me oh about. I and so then, wanted it yeah, too I, I it just that and APR states that's not a legal deer no and and why 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 is there and, a biological reason no no there's not there's and not. And you can take that to the call bucks or the maintenance. Like it's just there's so many elements to it where it's it literally is just you didn't pay for my tag, but you think you are entitled to tell me how to spend it. I am telling you how you should how you should do it. Yeah, and it's jealousy. Mm-hmm. I think it's jealousy. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I said, I shot a spike during gun season. It was a three legged deer came in. Yep. Um, I would have had to sit there and watch that thing suffer and walk away if I would have set, been sitting in a, in Pennsylvania where you can't shoot them anymore. Right. You know. Um, what about and we in this? I do not want this to go off on the rails and go for another forty five minutes on this topic. But uh, you and I have been both immersed in social media basically since it started. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of BS on social media. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of bad stuff. I know there's some good stuff. Um, how is it affecting us? mentally as a community uh, yeah uh, you, but we don't want to take it for another but i don't want to take that for 40 but can you do that in 30 seconds i'll, no. I'll try yeah <laughs> I'll, I'll, tr- I'll do what i can brevity is not one of my can mega you do that gifts. in a short yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Get, get it on a something, reel something can really nice and reel, clickable please? yeah it's instant gratification you know and if if we and if there's a challenge for you know, that's part of the challenge for hunting because it's not that you may go a day or a week without killing a deer. You might go years without filling a tag. And in a, in an, in a community that has conditioned itself, literally conditioned itself, not an outside force, has conditioned itself to, I posted a photo. Do I have a like yet? Do I have five likes yet? Did anybody comment? It's just, it's that instant gratification mindset that we're, we're just we're chasing dopamine. Yep. But we've we've so. But do we? I mean, how do we wean ourselves off of it at this point? You, you have to unplug, and you you have to. For me, you you got to have two buckets, right? And because you're never going to get off it completely, but you have to have your social media bucket, and then you got to have your real life. Social media is not real life. There are glimpses of real life. But social media is not real life. If you care more about how many likes the video that you posted of your chickens got than your 12 fresh eggs that you got today, that's the imbalance. Yep. Find a way to calibrate, calibrate your life to appreciate the real part, not the... R E E L the real real, that you posted. I love that. Right, like, and it's. I I was talking to a buddy of mine in in a booth as we were starting to wrap the show up yesterday, and um, for whatever reason, I don't know. I'm turning forty in March. Dang, my condolences. Punk, you are so old. Relative to the industry, I'm still the punk kid, right? But then, you know, I've been in it for a while now, and maybe it's this midlife crisis element coming up because I'm turning forty. But there's just there's been these little these little vignettes. These I've just they've come to me as I'm doing other stuff, and I've just sat back and 
you know, I'll I'll complain about my job and all because it's it's work, but it's actually it's it's a <laughs> I've I've told this story to everybody else and I don't think I've told you. So um, when my when my brother was doing his student teaching, he's a teacher. Uh, they asked me to come in and talk to one of the classes about like resumes and, and cover letters and that kind of stuff. And we're talking and I'm in Indiana. So, you know, half the, half the kids in the class hunted. And once they find out I was still at a previous job, they find out what I do. Like one of them raises their hand and go, do you have your dream job? I, I kind of stop for a second and I'm like, I'm going to sell, I'm going to say something that's going to make your, your teacher mad say if anyone tells you find something you love to do and you'll never work a day in your life is lying to you and I could literally see the teacher put his head in his hands like who is this jerk that we just invited in here and I this is the exact I'm not this isn't because we're on the podcast the exact example I gave is before I came to this job I was unemployed and if Dan Schmidt would have called me from deer and deer hunting and said Trent Marsh Dan Schmidt deer and deer hunting I have an open feature in the next issue of Deer and Deer Hunting. I would love for you to write it. I would have wet myself. I'd have been so happy to get that phone call. I said, now I know Dan. We talk. We're friends. If Dan calls me tomorrow and says, Trent Marsh, Dan Schmidt, Deer and Deer Hunting, I have an open feature in the next issue of Deer and Deer Hunting, and I need you to write it. I'm still going to be happy, but it's an item on a to-do list. Is my to-do list cooler than a lot of other people's? Absolutely. But I enjoy being hunting adjacent as much as I enjoy being in a tree. So, you know, we're talking about finding the joy of moments. And to me, being on the phone with you and just, did you see X and griping about it? Like, I enjoy that as much as drawing a bow, pulling a trigger. And for most people, that's not the case. But we have to figure out what those moments of joy are for ourselves away from social media and, and immerse ourselves in those and make sure those are tangible. And it's just, it's been, like I said, just over the last two weeks, I feel like I've had a lot of these come back to me, you know, because it's you know, almost 15 years in the industry. And um, I, I was asked to give a session at ATA. Who am I? Like... I still struggle with, I'm not that dude. I'm just the punk kid that's here. You are that dude, unfortunately. But but it it never feels that way, right? So, and it's it's hit me hard several times where like, wow. And and I don't know if it's because I'm trying to, I'm I'm literally, what we're talking about is something I'm, I'm mindfully working on. Trying to not get bogged down in the social media, trying to find the joy in some of those kind of things, and and enjoy some stuff that maybe I wasn't letting myself enjoy. And man, you start putting yourself in that mindset, and you'll just be sitting there making macaroni and cheese for your kid, and you, an emotion hits you, and I mean, it just about puts me on my ass because it's like, who am I? I did a panel with Will Br- like yeah. Will Brantley's. That's Will Brantley. Why am I on a panel with Will? And I, I was lucky. I got to go first. Dan Johnson spoke third, and he got up there, and he's like, so now I have to follow Will Brantley, which is like, you know, follow, uh, Nickelback following Led Zeppelin. Like, I said, <laughs> hey, that's why I went first. Like, it, no. It just, it, it, it's crazy, and it, it was a really long-winded answer to the question, but find those moments where you can actually enjoy an endeavor or an experience for the endeavor or the experience, not the dopamine rush that you've got by sharing that endeavor. You know what, what you're saying there, Trent is it transcends what we're talking about because it it goes to regular life because you don't have to, I mean, we're talking about hunting, you know, we're talking about if you are immersed in hunting and that's what you love and you are also immersed in social media, no matter if it's like you want to somehow become part of the industry or you're just doing it because you like it, um, it, it goes to the other parts of your life. Yeah. It goes to the parts of just enjoying that moment. It's, life is about moments. Charlie Alshamer told me that all the time. It's a, it's, a, it, it's a never-ending chain, and you are one link in that chain. Yeah. And all those other links are moments, relationships, you know, family members, things like that. And... Stopping, like you said, I liked your macaroni uh, uh, example. Stopping, I've done it out in the woods. Mm-hmm. Take that 
flipping phone and put it in my backpack and just listen to that chickadee. I'm not seeing any deer. And I think this is boring. This sucks. I'm not seeing any deer. No. There's all these moments. Man. Hey, we know what that sound means. It means we're going to take a break to thank one of our sponsors. Today's episode of Deer Talk Now is brought to you by Easton Archery and the all-new 5mm Autumn Orange FMJ. Celebrating Easton's 100 years in archery, the 5mm Autumn Orange FMJ is a fresh take on an old favorite. Featuring Easton's exclusive FMJ aero technology and finished with the classic Easton Autumn Orange anodized finish. This limited edition offering gives archers a modern arrow with a throwback nostalgia to arrows they may have never put in their quiver before. I did. I had the, those original autumn oranges when I was younger. These are available in four popular sizes, 250s, 300s, 340s, and 400 spines. And it also includes hit inserts and five millimeter x nox installed. Very, very, very cool. I will be shooting these arrows in that throwback autumn orange while hunting for deer and deer hunting TV this year on our Pursuit Channel shows. You might already know I'm a big fan of the FMJ line. To begin with, these arrows are skinny, they're straight, and they pack a punch. My particular setup, those arrows are 11.3 grains per inch. Plenty enough power I'm getting there on downrange kinetic energy, even though I'm only shooting 54 pounds. This adds up to a mighty wallop downrange on whitetails. Check them out at your nearest Easton Arrow dealer or visit EastonArchery.com for more information. The other thing I wanted to talk about, and I know it gets to be negative, but it, I've kind of been on a rant lately is, and I know a couple bad apples spoil the cart, but the, the, the crap that we see out there, just the um, irreverence of laying next to a dead deer doing something stupid. Um, obviously, I think anybody who's listening to this probably has a, is cognizant enough that it's like they're not going to do stupid things, and we don't. I don't have to sit there and chastise and browbeat somebody. Hey, don't be an idiot. But I think more people need to speak up and stand up for things that. I mean, I'm talking about the egregious, yeah. you know, um, things that are just. Because we're talking, if you're talking about the non-hunting public, that is eventually or essentially is what's going to dictate our lifestyle. Yeah. And um, what are your views on what you see out there? Is it gotten any better? or Is it getting worse? I, I honestly, I think it's gotten better. Like I, I think the the cesspoolness of social media has actually been on the on the decline. Like it's it's getting better in a lot of ways. Why is that? Just are we self policing ourselves? I, better? I think a lot of it is we've self policed, and it for me it's because I, I see I see the same thing, and what we just talked about, like I, I, the struggle I have is I see that and I look at it and I go this is stupid, and I want to say something, but then in that next breath or the next thought I have is, but it's not for me to yuck your yum. Do I think it's gauche and disrespectful? Yes, but. Is it is it rising to the level that I need to police what they're doing? And that's where I say, is it is it egregious? Is it just in poor taste? You know, trying to find that line of where where it rises to the level of needing to be policed. You know, you want to take a picture like that. Maybe it's fine for a group chat with your buddies, but do you really want to put it on social media? And, and honestly, I think what it, we've policed some of it, but anymore, the platforms don't like hunters. Right. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat. If you got to try to have a hunting TikTok, good luck. Yeah. Like it just, it's, they're, they're going to pull your content. And the more stupid and egregious and reckless you are with it, the more reports you're going to attract from the anti hunters. And the more borderline it is, the, you know, you're not going to get the support of anybody else. So the, the platforms have deplatformed some of the ones that were the worst about it because they're just, they're being ridiculous about their content. And, there's nobody fighting for them to be brought back because they look like idiots. So between us policing a little bit better and trying to, to monitor that, um, you know, in a lot of instances, I don't know that it, I don't know that all the time it was people act like doing it to be idiots. 
when we talk about all these adult onset hunters and the new people coming in, they didn't have a dad or a grandpa to say, hey, this is how we do this. They, they get caught up in the vortex of crap that is social media. They see some other joker doing it. They think that's what they do. They do it. Then they, you know, and, and then they kind of get repositioned. And that's where, like I said, trying to find that line between not yucking someone's yum, not being the, the social media police for the way somebody else chooses to do it. But, you know, between, between the platforms, between the, the self-policing of, of the industry ourselves and just showing people a better way. You know, that's, I think that's the best thing that we can remember is the right, you see somebody do that, the right comment isn't, you look like an idiot, why are you being such a jackass? It's, hey, is, is that the amount of respect you want to show that animal? You know, not, couldn't, couldn't take a picture before you got to the back of the truck with bloody tongue hanging out, like, hey, throw, make, just send them a message or comment hey maybe maybe you want to keep a towel in your backpack so you can clean the deer up before you take a picture like sometimes it's not done egregiously folks just don't know better because if nobody shows you how do you know and you know i've i've got i've got some it's funny like similar similar sort of thing like i've got some friends that i think are pretty good friends and they know what i do for a living and they'll call some other buddy to come help with stuff or to ask a question. And I, like, my feelings almost kind of get hurt. Like, you, like, you know what I do, right? Like, you're asking this dude that I know doesn't know anything. You're getting bad advice. Like, ask me. I know you just, you just bought the issue of deer and deer hunting that I have an article in. Why are you asking Bubba Smith over here that can barely read deer and deer hunting what he thinks when I can help you. Right. Like it's, it's, it's tough. It really is because seeking out and finding mentorship when one isn't organically presented, when you're like raised up in hunting like that, especially for something like hunting is so tough and trying to, trying to present a a community that is here to help instead of going all the way back to the first thing we started talking about, about the infighting and the, the nonsense. Like we have to make sure that in our effort to elevate hunting, we aren't feeding into that first thing we talked about to where we're always being so negative with the entire audience that we're turning off other hunters. It's, it is a fine blurred line and it's not easy to navigate for sure. You kind of answered my question, but, um, where do you see deer hunting 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now? I hope I still see deer hunting 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. Um, I, I, I have concerns. I, I do have concerns. Um, I, you know, the, the full-time gig right now is with, with trail cameras, right? And we're seeing trail camera bands pop up. And they're popping up in the places you would expect them. They're popping up in the we're seeing that infiltration of wildlife management agencies by folks who do not consider hunting to be a viable wildlife management tool. But the entire North American conservation model is built off using hunters as that tool. And this goes back to we we're feeding into this because I'm a deer hunter. I'm a bow hunter. I'm a left-handed traditional bow hunter that only hunts on from trees that are hung on the east side of it. Like, it's just, it, we, we self-niche so much, and then we don't care about what happens with something that's not our niche. Yep. Well, I don't care about, tra- I don't trap, I don't care. Right. I'm not, I don't care if we can't trap. Well, do you turkey hunt? Well, yeah, every spring. Might want to care about you trapping. Care about trapping. You know, oh, I don't, I don't care if you can hunt bears with hounds, really? Yeah. Because they're, the... Not again. I don't have to apologize for me. Like, the attacks on hunting are coming from the left. Period, paragraph, story. It's not up for debate. It is what it is. By and large, those attacks are coming from people who are on the left side of the political spectrum, and they are better at the long game than we are. They, it goes back to that that whole thing about, you know, somebody that's 80%, agrees with 80% of the time is an ally. Not, they are happy to take one bite of that elephant. 
And as hunters, we tend to want that whole elephant right now. And we'll lose. Because the other, the other part of the mindset is, by and large, the mindset of the hunter is, I just want to do my thing. Yep. I want to do my thing and I want to be left alone. Yep. And that leads to not, not being as involved in some of that kind of stuff when the other side is just absolutely full of activists who... It's the same thing with politics in it, general. It, it, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's what we... It's, it's not enough for them to just say, hunting's not for me, so I'm not going to participate. Hunting's not for me, and therefore nobody should be able to do it. So when that's what your opposition looks like, and when you have a huge portion of your, your allies that are saying, I'm for hunting, but not that kind of hunting, so I don't care what happens to it, you break that down across 30, 40, 50 different segments, and will deer hunting still be a thing? Probably. But will trapping? I don't know. Yeah, I know. Will bear hunting? Yeah, we're already losing that. Yeah, I know. It just... So... You know, it's it's the the highest population big game animal in the continental United States. Eighty percent of every dollar spent on hunting in the United States goes toward chasing whitetail. Right. So is that gone in 20, 30, 40, 50 years? Probably not. But how much of the balance of the industry? Because it's only 20 percent of every dollar and that's divided up amongst elk and mule deer and pheasants and turkeys and trapping and everything else. How, how does that stuff survive with that kind of attack going on? I do not know. Yeah. Um, it, it's concerning. I think it, it'll it'll kind of hit that wall. Like the, we'll lose it in the West. We'll lose access. We'll lose whatever the case may be. I, it'll hit kind of a wall as it moves east to those higher population states. Because I've been asked about it with the trail camera stuff. I'm like, you know, okay, you can ban it in Arizona or you can ban it in Utah. Because for the most part, it's not Colorado or it's not Arizona or Utah that hunts there. It's Minnesota, it's Pennsylvania, it's, it's the out of state hunters. And they got enough stuff going on at home, they're not paying attention. Right. So once it makes it to their state, there'll be a stink. But even then, New Jersey canceled bear hunting, Florida canceled bear hunting. Which is crazy. So it's not that they can't get it done. Yeah, and Florida has a, a large population. It's a ba- well, New Jersey. A I mean, they're they're yeah. talking about having to bring it back because of all the yeah. the bear human interactions that they're having because they're not hunting. We're seeing that with coyotes everywhere. Uh, We're seeing that with did other. Did you things. see the? I just saw a video, and it's not that long ago. That coyote coming like came up and tried to take the, the dude's. He let his daughter out of yeah. the. Right next to a car in the middle in of the a middle, neighborhood. In the middle of a suburban neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. it's. And then, then, then we see it every. We see it. At, there was a, there was a mountain lion spot. Well, yeah, that's what happens mm-hmm. when you don't have trappers. Mm-hmm. I'm a big proponent. I don't, I don't like. I trap on my own land because I can. Yep. But I don't run trap lines. But you have, and that's one thing people. You have to support. You got to support everybody on the team. Mm-hmm. You can't just support the quarterback. Right. Because well, he's only as good as the people around him. I uh, I gave I've given a presentation twice in the last the last year about you know kind of the trail cam element. Now I'm going to go political for a fourth time. Might be a record. That's okay. On, might be a record. It for is the a podcast. record on Deer Talk. Yeah. Yes, but I think is. I've tied it in well, so you, it's okay. You, We're going to move flawlessly. Right. It's a uh, the quote, whether it's accurately attributed to Franklin or not. If we don't, if we don't hang together, we'll all hang separately. So you can either get on board. And push back against all of it at once, or one at a time. One at a time. It's one up to time. you. Well, we're that's our uh, our abbreviated conversation with Trent, and we're going to have Trent back because Trent, you do this better than anybody. You, you and you tie it in so eloquently, which is what I like about it because those themes are consistent. So, anyways, uh, thank you very much. No, appreciate it. Um, spy point. Yeah. Spoil oh point. Yeah. What I do for a what living. What you actually do for a living. <laughs> you have a couple new products this year. Three, yeah. Three. Give me a very quick rundown and where can people find them? So uh, the Flex that was huge for us last year, uh, we've got a, a integrated solar panel option for that now. The Link Micro, number one selling trail camera of all time. It was my first day on the job in 2019, was launching the most popular cell camera of all time. 
Yay. I'm good at this. And the, the, those solar panels are awesome. The solar panels are awesome. You don't so have to sit there and chew through batteries like crazy. The Link Micro got an update. We're the LM2 this year, so we launched in that camera this year. And then we've got the Force Pro S, again, the solar panel option for a non-cellular option. So you uh, can find more information about all those, spypoint.com. You'll see all the new product and uh, can find us there. And, of course, all social media. Just search SpyPoint camera and you'll find us. And, actually, the new, uh, the new copy of Deer and Deer Hunting will have that. And the equipment annual will also have those in there. Well, Trent, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Appreciate your time. For Trent Marsh, I am Dan Schmidt. Thank you for joining us for Deer Talk Now's podcast. And we will catch you next Thursday with another new episode. See you next time. This episode is brought to you by Drop Tine Spirits and their premium 12-point bourbon whiskey. The story of Drop Tine's finest bourbon starts with being double barrel aged. What this means is they first aged the bourbon in new charred oak barrels in America's heartland then send it to California to be finished in the salt air of the Pacific in the finest brandy barrels. Finishing their bourbon in brandy barrels was the choice of many trials to find flavors as unique as the drop tine deer. They wanted a bourbon that is not only warm to the palate, but it would sip smoothly and leave notes of fruit behind. They found the perfect brandy barrels in the Russian River Valley near Sonoma, California, and what they created is a bourbon whiskey that exhibits a sweet, floral, almost honey-like aroma balanced by caramel, toasted wood, brown sugar, and toffee. 12-point bourbon is only available online. To get a taste for yourself after the hunt, visit droptime.com. Deer Talk Now is also brought to you by Hunt Stand and the new Hunt Stand Pro app. Let me tell you, I've been using the Hunt Stand app for a couple seasons now, and I can honestly say it has changed the way I hunt. There's no more guessing on wind direction, property lines, and stand locations. The app takes my hunting to precise new levels that help me be more successful. The new HuntStand Pro app unlocks unlimited property data on a nationwide basis, including detailed property boundaries throughout the United States and most of Canada, including property owners' names in the United States with detailed ownership information. You can also access detailed public land maps and search for properties on a county, state, or province level. There are so many features that also help you dial in on the best spots based on weather conditions. For more information, visit the App Store or log on to HuntStand.com. This podcast is brought to you by Cuddyback Cameras. I'm going to tell you guys, I've known Mark Cuddyback personally for over 20 years, and I've been using those cameras for over 18 years on Deer and Deer Hunting TV. The recent technology in the past few years has absolutely blown me away. And for those of you who don't have great cell coverage where you hunt, Cuddyback's ability to daisy chain from one camera to another camera with new Cuddylink technology is an absolute lifesaver. With the ability to connect 24 cameras, I place one home base camera at the edge of my property, swap that card out just once a month, and I get a look at all the activity on my entire property. My deer stay unpressured and the conditions are prime for opening day of bow season. For those of you who have the luxury of cell service, check out their new Cuddyback Tracks technology. This is game changing. For more information, go to Cuddyback.com. Deer Talk is also brought to you by Traditions Firearms, a family owned business and inventor of the new Nitro Fire muzzle loader. When owner and president Tom Hall and his daughter Allison first showed me the Nitro Fire system, I was immediately impressed that it is not only more convenient than conventional muzzle loaders, but it is safer. The ability to quickly remove the powder charge is a big deal, such as when crossing a fence, climbing into or out of a tree stand, transporting your rifle in a truck or an ATV, or when hiking rough hills, wading creeks, or plunging through swamps. I've used the Nitro Fire on numerous deer and deer hunting TV hunts over the past two years, and I find it safe, accurate, and very dependable. The gun is available in numerous configurations. To learn more, visit traditionsfirearms.com. The Deer Talk Now podcast is also brought to you by Apex Outdoor Rewards. Hit record and win rewards. Enter the Apex Whitetail Challenge in your state for your opportunity to win big cash. Enter today and get a 4K camera absolutely free. That's a $300 value absolutely free. There are some serious rewards here, guys, so be sure to enter in your state. Who would have thought your next buck 
could be putting money in your pocket. Reserve your spot today at apexoutdoorrewards.com. The Deer Talk Now podcast is also brought to you by Full Range Mounting Systems. These mounting systems are a great way to manage all of your mounts in a stylish and organized manner. We are using their pedestal mount here on the podcast set for two shoulder mounts and it looks just awesome. Be sure to check out all their mounting solutions at fullrangesystems.com. And finally, Deer Talk Now is brought to you by 10 Point Crossbow Technologies. Hey, if you've watched me on Deer and Deer Hunting TV, you know that I'm an equal opportunity bow hunter. And for most of the past decade, that has also included crossbows. In fact, I shot my first crossbow deer with a 10 point over 12 years ago. And to say that I've been impressed with their technology is an understatement. This year, I'm shooting the new Nitro 505, the fastest crossbow in the world. It is light, compact, and includes the revolutionary AccuSlide cocking and decocking technology. Whether I'm in a tree stand, ground blind, or spot and stalk hunting, I know the Nitro 505 is up to any challenge. Check one out at a dealer near you or log on to 10pointcrossbows.com for more information.